In today's ultra-competitive business world, being a successful entrepreneur or business owner can be very challenging. Fortunately, contemporary times have blessed us with resources for tackling those challenges and getting us to success more quickly than we could have imagined. Welcome to The Root of All Success with the real Jason Duncan, a podcast that explores how the world's most powerful entrepreneurs grow incredible companies. This podcast looks at the five keys to unlocking success as an entrepreneur. A successful educator turned entrepreneur, Jason's mission is to use his gifts of teaching and leadership to help others get the results they want out of life. Join Jason every week and learn the keys to grow a truly successful business. Hi there, welcome to the Root of All Success podcast with me, the real Jason Duncan. This is a podcast where I interview super successful entrepreneurs about how they grew incredible companies. And I've got this theory that there are five indisputable keys to success that every successful entrepreneur has has gone through at some point, whether they knew it or not, to lead them to the success that they've achieved. Now, generally speaking, in this podcast, I talk to entrepreneurs who founded their own business without the help of a family business. They didn't use a franchise. They've created a business that generates more than $10 million in annual revenue, and they have an individual personal net worth of greater than $5 million. So generally speaking, that's who I have on the podcast because I want you as listeners to understand how these people got successful, how they went through their the process of becoming successful, and how you too can be successful. We're recording this live in Nashville, Tennessee at The Standard at the Smith House. We're in the Matador Room, so this is on YouTube and on all the audio uh, podcast players as well. So if you're listening by audio, you should really go find this on YouTube so that you can see the room we're in. It's really a phenomenal room. We're in the Matador Room at The Standard at the Smith House in Nashville. It's a private club and a restaurant, and this is uh, 18,000 square feet of Southern sophistication style, and the proprietor is the great one and only Joshua Sterling Smith, and he's so kind to let us use this location to record. So if you're watching on YouTube, you get to see how cool this, this little room is. And today, today for those of you that are watching, is uh, this is where actually my guests and I are smoking some really nice cigars as we do the podcast today, which is not every guest wants to do that. That's fine, but we could do that here because we're at the standard. So, so you go, for those of you watching on YouTube, you see a little smoke wafting in the camera. <laughs> that's what that's what's going on. So today's podcast is brought to you by Results University. Are you ready for success? Results University is a premier online educational platform for entrepreneurs and business leaders. We teach five subject areas of entrepreneurship, leadership, sales, financial literacy, and we even have courses on spirituality and faith. It is designed to deliver world-class education content that takes 18 to 24 months to go through. It's completely self-guided. It's all online for a low monthly tuition. And if you are a listener to the podcast, you get a discount on your tuition. All you got to do is go to the root of all success dot uh, com to, to find out more or you can go to resultsuniversity.org slash root that's resultsuniversity.org slash root to find out how you can get discount on tuition just for being a listener to the podcast so thank you for being here with us today we are also syndicated on the c-suite radio network so i want to say thanks to the c-suite radio network for allowing our podcast to be on there with so many other amazing podcasts all right now let's get on with the episode for today so my guest texas born and tennessee raised my guest has always had an entrepreneurial spirit he has a desire to change the world he has a he had a straight a he was a straight a student from what I could tell, <laughs> based on our stories that he's told me over cigars <laughs> and glasses of bourbon, uh, straight A student in college, graduated at the top of his class from Tennessee Tech University here in Tennessee. He's a dedicated husband with two beautiful little girls. He owns and operates many businesses that range from real estate to engineering, even technology. Um, these businesses make Derek a very happy man. They bring in over $40 million annually in revenue. He is on a track five-year plan to get to half a billion in revenue. And if anybody can do it, I, I know Derek well, and I know he'll be able to do that. So I want to welcome Derek Godwin to the show. So Derek, thank you for being here today, man. Jason, thanks for having me. <laughs> well, excited to be here. <laughs> well, so here's the thing. Um, I, I, in my businesses, I've worked with a lot of engineers over the year. <laughs> And you do not at all fit the engineer kind of, kind of the motif and what the engineers look like. I mean, how did you, how did you go from this straight A engineering student to have the swag <laughs> that you have as a business owner? 
Well, you know, I'm not the typical engineer. I get that a lot. I'm a good salesperson. I'm a closer. But, um, you know, straight-A student, people people look at that and engineering degree, and you automatically get tagged as introverted and um, shy, which, which I'm probably a little bit of both. But we've set bigger goals that we can overcome, and my goals far outweigh any hesitation and shyness that I have. So we're able to be successful and talk and enjoy doing business with you know other people and pick up new clients and keep on going. I've known you, Derek, for a while, and we've become uh, pretty good friends. We've actually gone camping together, done some things, so I've appreciated getting to know you. But what I, what I think is really interesting about you, and I want to kind of talk about today, is how you went from, um, you know, you were a straight-A student in the college, engineering track at one of the great engineering schools here in Tennessee. We're really in the Southeast. It's a great engineering school, Tennessee Tech. And you now own several businesses, are creating tremendous amounts of revenue, working all over the country, traveling a lot. So how did you go from like that engineer track to become super successful, like business owner? What Tell us how that happened. You know, so when I uh, graduated college, it was during the recession or just, just before the recession, Great Recession in 09. And I had a job at a company as an engineer, and you know we didn't have any work. Um, so you know, while other guys at work were playing cards all day and sitting around not doing anything, I got in one of the company vehicles and went out driving across the country and finding railroads to work for because everybody has needs and show up at their doorstep and hey, we can help you. And so you know, really it was um, it was because I had to. You know, I wanted to eat. I didn't want to be unemployed. And we didn't have any money. Well, man, that's that's how I really got my start and figured out I was really good at sales and, you know, managing clients' expectations and making them feel comfortable with the work we're doing and pick up more and more work and, and grow companies. So when did you move from, obviously it sounds like you were an employee at that point, mm -hmm. just being a very ambitious employee who didn't have to wait to be told to go do something. You went out and did it on your own. But how did you move from employee to business owner? So in 2013, I, I uh, saw had an opportunity to go out on my own, and that's you know went out on my own because you know I was able to I was confident in my ability to sell, and confident in my ability to build relationships, and complete work, and have an opportunity to you know continue doing the same work that I'd been doing for the past decade at that point. So when you made that decision. I mean, was that, was that, hey, I've got a ton of money in the bank. I'm just going to go start this. If it fails, ah, it's okay. Or like, tell us how you were able to get that off the ground because that sounds like a big deal. Yeah. And there, there's a lot of barriers to entry in the uh, industries that I'm in. Uh, insurance costs are enormous. Working on the railroads is very risky. You know, one of our insurers is Lloyd's of London. So you get those guys involved and instantly start paying a whole lot of money. Um, when I started, yeah, we had uh, my young, uh, my oldest daughter, Ashlyn, was, I guess she was probably two at the time. My wife wasn't working, and then I became unemployed to start, you know, and live this dream that we'd been talking about for quite some time. When I left, I had 96000 in my 401k, and I had a hundred, I borrowed $100,000 from my mom. So, you know, oh. that, that was the only money that we had. We had no other money in savings, and, you know, we had no assets we had a house that was leveraged out completely because you know we're a new couple and and uh, build a house and that was that was kind of the lifestyle then so we put it all on the line every bit of it wow well let me tell you so as we talk about people becoming successful i want to make sure that the listeners understand that like th th that was seven a little over seven years ago maybe not even mm -hmm. just a little about seven years ago yeah. here we are today that risk that you took now it's turned into a company that's bringing in over four, or companies that are bringing over forty million dollars in revenue. That that is uh, astounding, and that is, sounds like success. So, how would you? I mean, would you consider yourself successful? I mean, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, you know, every, every day we get up, and I've got my family by my side, and you know, we've we've got opportunities to grow companies and and uh, take care of all of our employees because we're we're nearing one hundred and fifty employees right now. Wow. And um, you know, if you're way I look at it, we've got the average family has four mouths. We're feeding 600 people a day and, you know, 300 retirements and 300 college funds. And, you know, we, we really get a lot of joy out of um, getting up and 
Yeah, I consider myself very, very fortunate and very successful. So what would you, part, you know, this is the root of all success. So we talk about success in general terms and define it. And then we talk about how you got to become successful, like how, what your journey was to, to get there. So let's start with what you would define success in your own words. And I know a lot of people have different definitions and you could look up dictionary definitions. They're all different. But what does, what does Derek Godwin believe in his own words, the word success? What does that mean? You know, and Ben, you're right, Jason, success for everybody is different. And so, you know, success for me is setting a goal with my wife and um, working together towards that goal. It doesn't mean you've reached that goal yet, but um, it's not a it's not a dollar amount. It's not a, I mean, it's, it's very broad, um, I guess, shoot. You know, it's, it's a very broad window of what success actually is. Yeah, and it's uh, not just about money, is it? That's correct. Have you known a lot of uh, miserable millionaires? Yep. <laughs> I mean, hey, you know, money makes you more of what you already are. So if you're, uh, you know, if you're miserable and, and or rude and you get a lot of money, you're just more miserable, more rude to people, and, you know, it just magnifies what you already are. You said, you talked about you and your wife, that success is about setting a goal and, and reaching that goal. And what's interesting is that if you look at the word success from a dictionary's def- definition, only a few of the definitions, dictionaries list wealth or finances as a part of the definition, but almost every single one talks about that success is when you attain a goal. It's the result that you actually wanted. Mm-hmm. And so when you started, when you launched out on your own in 2013, right? It was 2013. Yep. When you launched on your own, what did you, I mean, and I, I don't know, 20, hindsight's always 2020, but like, if you go back and say, in 2013, when I said I'm going to do this on my own, what was the primary goal at that point? That's funny that you asked that because we think about those days a lot. Um, there's, you know, my primary goal was to put food on the table for my family. I mean, it was very simple. It wasn't a, I didn't see the opportunity at the time to grow a business and have lots of employees and um, you know be where we are today. That that wasn't part of the vision then. So. As we grow and set goals, you know, we're continually updating what the end looks like, our end game. And that's why we're looking at a half billion dollars of revenue now. That's unfathomable when you're at zero dollars of revenue and you're the only employee. It's half a billion dollars. So uh, recently, the lottery, <laughs> the lotteries <laughs> were up to, I mean, I, and I, honestly, I don't keep up with it enough to know if anybody won, but at the previous to the recording of this episode, the lotteries were up to like right at a billion dollars. Mm-hmm. And I don't think people understand how much money that is. So for a guy like you, who obviously straight A, very smart. And I, honestly, and I could say this, you're, you're one of the most intelligent people I know uh, because you, you know stuff that most people don't know and you figure stuff out. You, your brain works different than a lot of people. But from a guy like you who was super smart, but worked for another company, started something from from scratch, essentially, with borrowed money and a 401k, mom, and all that kind of stuff, to go from that seven-ish years ago to the potential within the next three to five years of being half a billion. That is absolutely astounding. I mean, did, was there ever a moment in your journey where you said, uh, like, this is stupid, we can't do this. Like, I'm going to go back to work for another company. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, there's there's lots of days that you regret starting the business, and um, you're, you're told how lucky you are. It's, it's not luck. It's it's the you know five thousand hours a year, twenty years of of working that that has made us an overnight success. Yeah. Um, it's there's nothing there's nothing more to it than doing the right thing and t- taking care of relationships. And yeah, there's there's those nights where you know where days where I still still to this day I work seventy two hours straight and. Sometimes I ask myself why, you know, and what we end up doing is looking at our goals and where we want to be and how we're going to get there. And that's the path that we've selected and agreed on. And, you know, that makes it all worthwhile at that point. Yeah, because that's what success, as we talked about, success is reaching the goal that you want. Like if you if you have a goal to get to a certain position, whether it's financially or or geographically, and you reach that by definition, you're successful. But what I what I love sitting across this table with microphones with other successful entrepreneurs is I learned that okay my original goal was I want to hit a million dollars in revenue and then my next goal is I want to hit ten or next and you're at half a billion right yeah. but 
honestly, you hit half a billion in the next five years, what's the next goal? I mean, it's going to change, right? So that's your right. next goal is three quarters of a billion. The next goal maybe is a billion. And that's, that is the hunger and the passion of an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. And that's really, and I want to I do this right now. So passion is the first P of success as far as I'm concerned. Like when I teach these five indisputable keys of success, there's passion, there's place, there's people, there's preparation and plan. So this passion idea, and I want to get your perspective on this for the listeners, is that there's two, there's two sides of passion. Number one, there's this excitement, just, just sheer joy and loving it. And you you work a lot, and we'll talk about the railroad consultants in a little bit more deeply. But you work a lot in the railroad business. Now, there may be passion and excitement about railroads in general and engineering in general, but there also is this other level of this other side of passion that means willing to endure, willing to suffer. And if you think about the passion of the Christ, and I mention this almost in every episode, it wasn't that Jesus was excited to go to the cross; it was that he was willing to suffer, willing to endure for the outcome. So you just mentioned that you worked seven, you sometimes work 72 hours straight. And I happen to know that because when I text you, you don't get back to me for a week. <laughs> it's because you're working. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but also know the stories that you've told me about how much time you put in. And you just mentioned 5,000 hours a year. And for the people that don't know how to do, how to do math uh, real quick, 2,000 hours a year is what a normal employee works at 40 hours a week, 50, 50 weeks a year, right? So 5,000 is more than double that. So it sounds to me, like passion is one of the keys to your success and and your passion translated into just working a lot of hours and putting in all the time. So tell, tell me and the listeners what you think about how passion plays a part of your success. Yeah. So we're very passionate about what we're doing, obviously. And, um, you can tell that cause my, I get excited talking about our businesses and where we can go and the opportunities that we have. I'm here, the passion in somebody's voice. We're talking on the phone to someone, you can't see them, but their their inflection will go up, their tone will go up. They'll talk to a higher pitch when they're excited, and that's just a natural body language um, that that you can hear and sense. So, um, you know, we've we've got some great goals. Um, our goals aren't selfish or greedy, and we we want to keep doing what we're doing the best. We we want to be the recognizable brand. Um, in fact, for for this year, um, we've removed the uh, words under our logo and we just have RC now because we want to be that recognizable brand nationwide. So we're rebranding right now and, oh, wow. and, um, we're working coast to coast. Um, it, it's, it's, I mean, if you don't have the passion and the drive and the fire, you know, we, we would have shut this thing down a long time ago and it's not that we aren't content or I'm content every day of my life. You know, if we never hit the half a billion dollars, I'll be happy every day that we're here doing what we're doing. And, uh, doing it with excellence and so you know it's not a you know people to, to this day people don't understand the that goal uh, now it's you know did 40 million last year in revenue and we're looking at you know this year probably 75 to 80 million with what we kind of got on the books right now so it's, it's a very attainable goal That's um, awesome. so so let's talk about railroad consultants um, RC as you said you're rebranding so mm-hmm. let's talk about that business in general, what is it that you, what services and products do you provide to your customers? Anything railroad, so uh, is, is what we tell them. But we're a professional service firm, and we also do construction. Um, we provide civil and structural engineering, mechanical electrical engineering. We provide permitting, surveying. Um, we're licensed, you know, we've got staff that's licensed all 50 states on engineering, a license in most states on uh, construction. And uh, that, that's really going to be the big growth is construction side. Um, that'll be the probably the largest growth that we'll have in all the companies. Just you know, we're working for a lot of the class one railroads right now, and getting in the door with the other class ones. And uh, it's all about relationship, mm-hmm. you know, and also doing what you said you're going to do. But you know, that that's how you build a relationship. Is um, you know, when we first got going, we risked it all a lot of times, and. And every day um, that we're out there, we're still basically risking it all, not in a risky sort of fashion. We put it all in line and we, we take the big jobs and we're always successful doing it, but it takes a lot of pressure to do that and a lot of coordination and good good personnel. I mean, we wouldn't be where we are today without the staff and relationships that we have. Yeah. So passion and risk seem like they go together in your stories that you are willing to risk, because, which is a suffer point, right? If you risk, there's this opportunity of loss, mm-hmm. but you calculate that against 
what the opportunity of gain is if in fact it succeeds. And you can't, like pe- people that say, oh, well, I think a lot of entrepreneurs understand the concept that with great risk comes great reward. That's not always the case, but your great rewards certainly don't come without great risk. Um, so with you, you risked a lot and you've been rewarded a lot with that. And that really has to play into your passion. Like there's something greater than just going out and, and playing with railroads and, and, and building bridges and tunnels and, and doing civil engineering and mechanical engineering. So, so on the passion side, I think I understand that, especially because I know you personally, I can see and understand the passion that you have for that. Let's talk about the second P and the success and how it may or may not have played into your story, and that's place. And I talk, to, talk about this in terms of being at the right place at the right time. So you were born in Texas, moved to Tennessee at some point early in your childhood, ended up going to uh, Tennessee Technology. Uh, what, what's the, I call it Tennessee Tech. What's the official name of Tennessee Tech? Tennessee Technological University. There you go, TTU. So you went to Tennessee Tech. That, it, was that the right place at the right time to get you where you are? Was there some other place you can point to and go, you know what, when, when I was at this place, that actually propelled me into where I am now? Yeah, yeah Jason, there is. You know, I, I grew up in a entrepreneurial family. You know, my, my new one my parents went to college, and my dad ended up taking over a steel business that was essentially bankrupt and turned it around. Um, you know, in college, and it was my sophomore year, and, uh, you know, my dad passed away. So the plan was always to work for dad, you know. I mean, we're going to grow the family business. Uh, we're going to, you know, I mean, that was the plan. All the kids were going to work in there, and we were going to grow that sucker and make it, it was a steel fabrication shop, make it a nationwide brand and, and uh, do a lot of work. Um, but, you know, I ended up, I was on scholarships. I was able to put my scholarships on hold and for in co-op. And so, you know, there, there's a lot of things that aligned to put us where I am today, um, you know. But but in the end, it's just God's plan for what we're doing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the the amazing thing is there's been opportunities that, that I passed up and then regretted. Um, but at the end of the day, it was part of the plan because it, it would have prevented me from doing what I'm doing today. Yeah, We had a lot of opportunities, a lot of different things um, due to my relationships. And I passed some of them up and thought, man, we just, you know, I should have taken that opportunity and go work for this guy or started this company. And um, at the end, at the end of the day, we're we're living our purpose. We we didn't start those companies and they were the good ideas or didn't go down that path or work for this other company, you know, at that time. And you know, I I would say it wasn't remorseful, but you do have those thoughts like, man, maybe I should have done that. And uh, you know. <laughs> Look, looking at that seven, eight years later, well, we made the right decision. You know, yeah. this this was the guidance and the path that we were really supposed to be on. Yeah, our ability to adapt will always outperform our ability to plan, won't it? I mean, yep. we as entrepreneurs, we get smacked in the face a lot. I mean, things happen. I, 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 one of the ways I kind of tell, tell people about this when I talk about it is that, and you'll probably, I think you and I may have talked about this before, that in the life of an entrepreneur, there's this invisible horizontal line below which when you go, you're done. Like you're out of business, probably bankrupt and mm-hmm. maybe people get hurt. Who knows? But the entrepreneur, the business owner, the founder is the only one who knows how close you are to that line at any moment. Yeah. <laughs> Cause it goes up and down, up and down, up and down like a heartbeat. Um, and of course you want it to go up further than it goes down at every, at every given time. But for you, you know, just like every other entrepreneur, you can point to places where, you know, we were really close to the line and I had the opportunity to do X. Mm-hmm. And I chose not to, and at the time I regretted it. But now I look back, I'm like, thank God I did not do that because I had I done that, it'd taken me a different, a whole different path. Yeah. Okay. So, so let's talk about people in your life. So, um, inevitably, when I talk to successful entrepreneurs like you, they can usually point at a person or two where they say, you know, that person, guy, woman, whoever it was, really was the person that helped get me to that next level. Do you have a person or persons like that in your life that you can think about? Yeah, yeah, we, there's there's lots of people. Um, uh, you know, there's there's people that gave me the chance on the railroad to start a company. Um, Barrier to entry, I was, you know, 28, right at 29 years old when I started the company. And people don't have multi-million dollar contracts with the railroad at 29 years old and no money. And, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so we've got some guys with the railroad that said, hey, we'll give you an opportunity, but you got to sell yourself to upper management as far as your capabilities and working, but we will say, hey, we at least consider this guy will set the meeting. 
And so, uh, you know, that, that was the first opportunity. And without that, we wouldn't be here, you know. It was, it was just a dream at that point, even with my imagination. And, and uh, I mean, it, it's a, you know, there's guys like that. And then our, uh, my CFO, um, who's also my stepdad, uh, he's like my real dad, but, um, you know, he, he's helped companies grow um, from nothing to hundreds of millions of dollars. And, I mean, he, he thinks we're going to do a billion dollars in revenue. And wow. and he he knows how to get deals done. He's his entire life, um, his CPA by trade. But for forty one years, all he did was acquisitions and mergers. And so we're you know we've grown this company one at a time up until this point. And uh, that's that's hard. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it's painful to grow one at a time. And I mean, we're we're starting to look at the M and A side. And um, biggest problem we're gonna have there is finding the right company. Um, there's a lot of opportunity right now, but we want to have the company that we can actually go in and, you know, rebrand and put our, um, you know, our beliefs and views in, make sure that they can adapt. And, you know, they need to be pretty closely aligned with what we already believe anyway, or, you know, it's just not going to work. So, you know, I feel like we've grown extremely slow. Um, (laughs) Seven years is not fast enough for Derek (laughs) (laughs) Hobbs. But... But, you know, I, I do see how fast we've grown. Um, it, of course, makes banks nervous because you're growing so fast. And um, there's opportunity everywhere. I don't, you know, it doesn't matter. There's not a person out there that's going to control my destiny other than myself. I, you know, I'm not going to wait the wor- on the world to, uh, you know, tell me what to do or act on me. I'm going to go act on the world. Um, you know, we drive down the road and I just see dollar bills everywhere, $100 bills hanging from trees and hanging in this guy's yard. He needs landscaping and this guy needs something painted. Um, there's just opportunity everywhere. Yeah. And it, it isn't that really what separates business owners from entrepreneurs. I mean, a business owner can take a business and run it. Like, and as long as the systems are put in place and, you know, he or she can run that business, that's a business owner. And there's certainly... Uh, there are certainly accolades that are due to people that run successful businesses, but the entrepreneur is what is doing what you just discussed. It's th- it's about looking for opportunities. It's 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 taking risks that a business owner wouldn't necessarily want to take. They just want to work in a, in a known system. Where an entrepreneur, the difference between an entrepreneur and a business owner is they want to risk things and they're willing to innovate things. They're looking for opportunities, and it sounds to me like that's exactly what you did in your career. So, tell, you know, you talked about the risks that you made in terms of time and there were some money risks. Were there any other risks that you've taken that, that you would want to share? Like this happened or, or I did this. This was, it sounded stupid at the time, but it turned into $10 million opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, obviously the risk of starting first company, um, <laughs> you know, I had, a, you know, everyone tell me, no, don't do it. Don't do it. But. They didn't understand, um, and they still don't understand. Like, well, yeah, you were right. You're lucky. To this day, I'm still lucky, just a lucky guy. Um, the harder is, you work, the luckier you get. That, that's that's my response to them. And, um, you know, as far as risks, <clears throat> now we, you know, we had one client that we wanted to do some work for, and they required, you know, 30 people on standby to do this work. And uh, so I said, all right, we got it done. And uh, I had seven days to hire, train, do background tra- checks and drug checks, uh, drug tests on 15 people. And then I had two weeks to get the other 15 on board. Wow. And uh, that's probably, that was at the point, that was about three or four years in uh, the company. And, you know, there's a new service we want to add and we want to be competitive in the marketplace and it was a good opportunity. So we went out and hired 30 people without having any work. And uh, so we, you know, then I sold all the work, right and God, you know, had everybody working within about a, you know, two month period. Mm-hmm. Um, but that, that was, you know, banks don't like that. You know, they don't understand that I'm confident in my ability to sell. And I've, you know, to this day, I'm still doing everything I tell them that I'm going to do and have met all the obligations and, and um, timelines and commitments that we've always told them. In fact, we beat them. Um, our projections, every year, our projections, we blow them out of the water. Um, I give them, what they don't think is a conservative projection. Um, I, I give them what I think is very conservative. And then we end up doubling, doubling that a lot of years. And, uh, just always, a it's always fun though. You know, it's, it's, you know, we aim, we aim for the, aim for the moon and, you know, miss we're lo- among the stars. And every year we, we far exceed our projections from the year before. I think it's interesting too now, um, and, and, and only an entrepreneur with the experience that you have and, and the experiences that I've had would know that having a banker on your team 
that understands the entrepreneurial mindset is extremely important because I've gone through bankers who simply were not entrepreneurial and they're like, look, if it doesn't make sense on paper, I don't even want to talk about it. And then I've got, I currently, thank goodness, I have a banker now who understands. He actually was a was an entrepreneur, had a business before he went into banking. And so he understands what risks there are. So when I go into him and tell him something crazy, he's like, yeah, we can do that. <laughs> yeah. So having that banker is really, really important. Yeah. Finance can make or break you. Um, yep. We're growing so fast, obviously need a lot of capital, um, which we've got capital retention plans in place. And uh, of course, we've got lots of people want to throw money at us and invest um, that we know out there. And, you know, we don't weren't going to give anything up. We, we've got big places we're going and, and uh, we've got a great banking team. Then, of course, our CFO used to be on a board loan committee. He was the head of that for some large uh, regional banks here. And he knows how negotiations work. And so we've got, you know, Every time he walks in the door, they feel they already look defeated when we go talk to them because <laughs> we'll they're going to give us whatever we need, and it's going to be the best daggum price you can get. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, so we so we talked about passion, we talked about place, we talked about people. So the so the last uh, the last two P's I talk about the first one first of the last two is preparation, and what I mean by that when I talk about preparation is I talk about you've got to be prepared to be successful in the thing that you're doing. So for you. You, you are in uh, primarily in the engineering space um, and railroads, t- generally speaking. But you, your preparation, it sounds to me like was, okay, I, my dad was, had this steel company, which there's some engineering involved in that. You went to school to get a degree in engineering. Was that your preparation to help you be successful or was there other things that you would point to? Was it a coach? Is it a mentor? Or was it a certification class? What, how, how did you get prepared to be a $40 million company seven years in? I, I guess at the end of the day, you spent my whole life preparing for this. You know, we, dad was always entrepreneurial. We really didn't have anything growing up, um, but hard work, integrity. Um, and we did construction, pro- worked on construction projects every weekend with my dad. We were building decks for somebody. We were building handicap ramps for people. We were cleaning gutters. We were, you know, doing, you know, work for the community, what, whatever it may be. But it was every single weekend we were doing something. Some weekends it was at the house, you know, we're cutting firewood and bringing it home and splitting the firewood and then stacking the firewood. <laughs> and so, you know, we just grew up working. Um, that was, you know, that was part of life. And that's, that's something that's really missing from, where we are today and um, this next generation coming up, um, it's work ethic. But talk about your college experience because, um, you know, a lot of times I mention on the, on the podcast when I'm talking to entrepreneurs, about 50% of them went to college, 50% didn't. It doesn't seem to be a, a strong indicator of success, generally speaking. But then there are specific things like what you're doing with engineering that it requires. Like So if you wanted to be a teacher, a doctor, a lawyer, engineer, et cetera, you almost have to have that degree, at least in my eyes, to, in order to, to do it. So ha- what part did your college degree play and prepare you for success? This probably a controversial topic, I guess, um, as you know. The, you know... I went to school to be an engineer. I, I'll tell you, I, I mean, I, I guess na- naivety or whatever you want to say. Um, I just, I was the youngest of three. My brother's two years older and a three, or two and a half years older. So it's three years ahead in school based on our birthdays. And he's going to school engineering. I was like, well, all right, I guess I'm going to go be an engineer because I'll do it better than him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that, was, Competition. that was literally how much thought I put into what, what profession I was going into. <laughs> wow. Um, but I mean, you know, we're gonna work for dad and run the company, you know, run the family business or do something anyway. Um, of course, again, they didn't have any college education. He was extremely successful, uh, you know, for a lot of reasons. But um, you know, college with without without college, um, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to be an engineer. You know, and so I wouldn't be able to start an engineering company. I could start a construction company, but you know, engineers, you know, fairly simple to get into from a cost perspective compared to all the equipment that we have now and all of the contracts nationwide and leases and everything we have to keep up with. I mean, it's very capital intensive, Mm -hmm. um, construction side is. So, you know, as far as college prepared me, um, we had some really good professors that are are no longer, uh, with us, but, um, they were the old school professors and, you know, you couldn't miss a day of class or you automatically got a B. If you miss two days, you got a C. If you miss more than two, yeah, that was assuming you had 100%. He would scale you back oh, yeah. that far. And uh, if you missed more than two days, you failed, had to retake it. I mean, you, you were, and you couldn't be late. Um, but 
at the end of the day, they taught us how to derive formulas and think and not just give you an answer. So they, they really gave us a fishing pole and taught us how to fish versus just feeding us like some of the other professors do. And something that's more and more prevalent in this day is here's the, here's the formula, but we learned the reason behind the formula. We learned how to develop that and derive that. And I still to this day can do that, you know. And so really, you know, college was, I was kind of a loner in college. Went to class and did all the work on my own and, um, you know, that's probably the big, biggest thing is, is that we I got from college is, is the derivations and learning how to think a different way and not just being provided answer. And, and I was already a critical thinker, but, uh, <laughs> you know, problem solver, that sort of thing. That's, that's always been my uh, cup of tea. But, you know, we, we, why I was so good in college because I was prepared for that. It just, you know, helped magnify what I was already doing. So when we talk about uh, preparation, that, that also leads to the last uh, of the five P's that I talk about, and that's plan. And so I, I firmly believe that successful entrepreneurs use these five P's, and the fifth one being plan, I, I believe that there was a plan. And, and the plan isn't business plan. Like a lot of people think, oh, well, so i got to have a business plan to be successful. No, not, ne- not necessarily, because I... I grew up a multi-million dollar company without a business plan. You, I don't know whether or not you had a written business plan, but what I find is that most entrepreneurs didn't. They didn't have a written business plan. So what I mean by the word plan is the strategy and uh, the strategy to obtain and deploy the resources required to be successful. So you mentioned in your story that in order to go out on your own, the insurance costs were, well, first of all, you had to have it, but they were astronomical. Right. So your plan, it sounds to me, your plan was, I will figure out how to get the resources required, which includes insurance, no matter what it takes. And you went and borrowed the money, as you just said, to, to pay for the insurance premiums. So tell us about how the plan and not, not written business plan, although if you had one, I'd be happy to hear about that. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I teach in my university how to write a business plan, but I also make sure that students understand this is not a prerequisite for success but rather you need a plan to get the resources. So talk us about how your plan worked to get the resources you needed. Yeah, so um, I don't have a written business plan uh, <laughs> right, right now and never really have. We're, we're growing and changing so fast. It changes every day. Um, you know, we, we, we're growing exponentially, not linearly. We don't have those plateaus and, and dips. We, you know, keep everybody busy. We've never to this day laid anybody off for lack of work and intend to keep that tradition alive because we see opportunity out there um as far as resources and plan it's all about relationships and abilities and having confidence um you know again for example when we hired the 30 people in two weeks and had commitments to have on site and trained and background checked and all that all those uh, commitments we did. I didn't have a plan. They called me. I was like, "Yeah, we can do it." <laughs> and I got, I got the, you know, at that point we had sixteen people in the company, so we doubled. doubled. Yeah, yeah, we we grew two hundred percent. Yeah, so tri- tripled in size in yeah, that amount here, which about bankrupted us because we, you know, we have all these people we got to pay, and you, they do the work, and all our clients pay us. But you do the work for thirty days, you invoice, you get paid thirty days later. So you got care, this carrying cost for sixty days. Well, I wasn't prepared for that. But you know what? We figured it out, and uh, you know we're—I don't sit there and um, negotiate, negotiate with clients. And you know I'm the closer. I negotiate with clients. Just tell me where we need to be, and then we'll figure out how to make it happen. We don't need to go back and forth 15 times. It's like a used car salesman or car, or car salesman in general, any kind of salesman. Just tell me what you want. Tell me that expectation. Tell me that number that you're looking for. If I can make it happen, I dig I will. And we just did one today. I was—that's why I was a few minutes late getting here. Um, I was working, and this is something I do about every day anyway, but I was working on another proposal, and uh, they finally gave me the number last night when it'd be at, and I sent, I'd even revise it and say, we'll do it for this amount, and I'll figure out the rest of it, and we'll figure out how to save money, figure out how to do it better and uh, more efficient, and we'll make money on the project, but we've also picked up a good client today. Yeah. You know, well, you know, that, every day. that concept, I refer to what you just described as fake it till you make it. And I know there's a lot of uh, a lot of gurus that talk about fake it till you make it is 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 not there's no integrity in that and that that's an '80s '80s thing, right? But but here's what I think about it. I think that you faked it till you made it, but you never lied to anybody. 
You just said, like they said, hey, you need 30 people. And you're like, okay, we got it. We can do it. And, and, and because you knew and you're betting on yourself, I can make, I have a plan to get those resources. That happened to human, human capital resources, mm -hmm. not financial resources. I have a plan to do it. So I can fake that I have it ready because I know that I will get it ready. And it's not, you didn't lie to anybody. You're not being less than integrous. And to this day, you, that has paid off in dividends for you, right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's one of the biggest segments of our business right now is that, that, um, division that we open. And for example, you know, the fake to make it does have a lot of negative connotations, but you know, I've never lied to anybody. They didn't say I had to have 30 that day. They said you have to have 30 people to do this work and you have to have them by this day. And I said, okay. You know, and, and uh, we, we got real busy. <laughs> <laughs> I go make it happen. I said, I mean, we, well, I got our last guy. I mean, I remember we got our last guy, guy trained at like 1 a.m. on Monday morning when he was supposed to be on site at 6 a.m. You know, five hours before the deadline, and uh, we made we made it happen. Wow. Um, but you know, a lot of people have great ideas. They never react. They never never do anything with them. I mean, if they're too scared, they freeze up. Um, I'm not one of those. Well. Yeah, let's commit, then I'll figure it out. Our, our mantra, one of our things we don't do is we don't say no, say yes. I mean, as long as it's in, got integrity and no issues along those lines, but we're, we're yes men, yeah, we can make it happen, anything. We make anything happen. We've proved that time and time and time again have yet to uh, stumble or fail on that. Now we've had some close, close, close ones. We're like, ooh, man, I'm glad we pulled that off. But um, you do that one time, you pick up a client for life. And uh, railroad, they've been around for, you know, since the 1830s building railroads here in the U.S. And so they're setting their way, ways, and uh, they've got their contracts they've used for three generations. It's stuff market to break into. It's all about relationships and getting that chance. I know that I I see, because cause you and I know one another personally, I, I see how much time and energy you put into traveling and being with your clients. And, and you just sent me some, some pictures of, you went on a duck hunt with some of them and stuff. I mean, I, I probably, I don't think I know any other entrepreneurs who spend as much time as you do with your clients. And I, it may be just because of the nature of the industry railroad. That's just what happens. But I don't know a lot of people that do that. What, what made you, is that a nature of the industry or, or is that just part of your nature? You know, uh, probably more my nature. Um, the, uh, you know, relationships again are key. Uh, we believe that. I mean, that that's safety and relationships, and we want to make money, and um, we want to have, you know, you know these goals met. But you know, we aren't whining and dining. And we're really friends with these guys. You know, we, there's and, and they hell they pay their own way. I mean, it's not a you know, it's just one of those deals. It's crazy, <laughs> but it's it's just about getting together and talking. We try not to talk a lot of business when we're together. If we're hunting or if we run to the lake, you know, we've got a client that I always go to lake with every year. He brings his boat and I bring my boat and we have our families and we hang out together and that's it. And we do that once a year on Memorial Day. And um, it's just, just one of those things. It's already on my calendar. Just just like camping every year with you uh -huh. um, in October. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you've got several businesses that you own. We we spent a lot of time talking about railroad consultants or RC. Is it actually just going to be RC or dropping the, dropping the whole words or? Well, um, we're still working on it. Yeah, still working on that. But we've got, you know, our RC is good because we've got, you know, like railroad consultants. We've got railroad construction, you know, railroad conglomeration, whatever conglomerate, whatever we may end up coming up with in the future. Um, but, you know, RC will be the um, the logo and the brand going forward. Not sure that's going to be the name. You know, if you look at Nike, they've got the swoosh, but everybody knows that it means Nike. Right. And so, you know, at the end of the day, we want people to see RC and think railroad guys, they, they can do it all. Anything huh. railroad. So what? So the other businesses that you have that are contributing to your success, do, do you have any that you want to kind of specifically mention that you're doing? Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah, we've, we've got, um, probably not by name, but uh, we, do, we do have a steel fab shop, and uh, we do a lot of uh, retail spaces, malls, um, do a lot of work for a lot of, lot of big clients. Um, some of the probably out of the top ten, largest companies in the world are probably doing work for three of them out of wow. the top 10 and they're probably close to the top five if not you know in there right. um so I, again that's that's about the relationship and being able to meet impossible guidelines of you know the, the railroad 
if you don't keep trains running, you don't generate revenue. Well, we don't get paid. We So we're very creative and innovative and understand what it takes to build a job and design a job uh, successfully, efficiently. We say we value engineer a lot of projects and save the clients millions of dollars. I mean, they love it. They love it. And we get <laughs> continual work because these other companies don't understand how to value engineer and, and uh, don't understand how to, they aren't construction guys too. You know, I grew up in the construction world and grew up welding and I understand access holes and how to get things done. And I, I, I go out there with the construction guys every once in a while and I work with them. Um, I did that. In fact, I did that right after Christmas on an emergency project. We went out there and uh, worked with the guys and I like to do that every, you know, once a quarter, once every six months when I, when I get out and show them that we do know what we're doing and, and uh, it, you know, builds, builds camaraderie and builds a good sense of culture, um, which is very important. I think a lot of entrepreneurs who are listening to this could probably um, would agree with my, my sentiment when I say that. You know, when you find the thing that you really are passionate about, that you really enjoy, and that you're really excited about, you, you kind of go all in. You're like, I'm in on this, whatever it is. And for me, I'm in on the things that I'm doing, and I love it. Mm -hmm. And so it's been a long time as an entrepreneur since I've looked at other opportunities outside of my own businesses and thought, I want to throw in with that guy, or I want to throw in with this girl because I, th I thought that their opportunity might be better than mine. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Like early in our early, like in your story, probably there were these times you were like, this other guy's got this ice cream shop. I think I can make it, <laughs> you know, I want it, whatever that is. Well, today as where I sit in my chair today, I, I don't, I don't I don't have that happen anymore. I'm not looking for other people's opportunities to, Oh, I want to get in on that. I think I can make a lot of money in that, or I could do that or I could be successful. But I will say this out of all the entrepreneurs that I know, you're the only guy that every once in a while that comes to me like, I need to partner up with him. Like something cool is happening. So I think I'm, I'm really excited that I know you. I'm excited that you, you're a part of this podcast. I'm excited. That I'm, I'm happy that we're friends. I'm honored that you're, you're a guest on this podcast because I believe that there's a lot of things that people who are entrepreneurs who want to be successful can learn from somebody like you. Now, you, you put in ungodly amounts of time and hours that I don't think a lot of people would be willing to do. But I think the outcome speaks for itself. I mean, you've got a, you know, your wife is fantastic. Your girls are awesome. Mm -hmm. I love, you know, your house is fantastic. And we go, we go hang out together and do different things. And so I appreciate you, Derek. I appreciate your friendship. I thank you for being on the, on the, on the show today. Is there anything else that you would want to tell the listeners about success or about your business or how to get in touch with you or anything else you want to share with us? I guess at the end of the day is to act. You know, a lot of a lot of people freeze up and don't have confidence in their abilities. Um, you know, and same thing for me when I when I started, it was really just to employ myself. <laughs> yep. You know, I didn't. Me too. <laughs> that, that's, <laughs> Got a that's, mortgage to pay. That, that's right. That's right. We're about starved to death. I mean, it was, it was close. You know, before the money started turning green, turned at the last minute. You know, on the last day, and finally things were up from there. You know, but. Um, I tell you, entrepreneurship's only can go from hero to zero, back to hero in about a 30-minute period. Um, and and uh, you got to hang on for the ride. you got to have that tolerance and, and uh, manage your risk good. But you got to have a good wife of the house, good, good family support or husband, a good spouse. Um, you know, the, the most important thing is that, you know, I, I, it's probably 99.9% .9 of people never act. They've got a good idea. They could change the world if if everybody that had a great idea would would go after that, um, or if half the people would think think about how different this world would be today. Um, and it, it's it's incredible. So my, my my biggest advice is just hey, you got an idea, don't be afraid to don't be afraid to go after it. If it doesn't work, you're in the same position you are today. Nothing's changed. If it does work, then you might have just changed the world. Well, there you have it, folks. You hear from a very successful entrepreneur, Derek Godwin, who has built a fantastic company with Railroad Consultants and all the other businesses that he has. And you see that my theory about these five indisputable keys to success, passion, place, people, preparation, and plan played out in his story, maybe in different ways than in other people's stories, but it could play out in your story as well. And now, if you want to see how your odds of success or probability, probability of success works out, I've got a, something special I want to offer you. If you go to therealjasonduncan.com slash success, so that's therealjasonduncan.com slash success, you can take a free five P's of success assessment. 
And that assessment will give you a personalized report showing you where you rank on those five things and whether or not you should proceed in that idea or that venture, or whether you should pick a new one. And what's in interesting about that assessment is that a lot of times when people take that assessment, they come up with, I don't, I don't have the passion for this like I thought I did, or I don't have the preparation that's going to be required to get there. And so you can either abandon it or you can just work on those particular P's and kind of get those, get those up. So go to the real slash success, download that and take that assessment. That's completely free. And of course, if you're interested in getting a world-class education in entrepreneurialism or business leadership, you can go to resultuniversity.org slash root for a special discount on tuition. So Derek, thank you again for being here. This has been great getting to know a little bit more of your story and enjoying uh, a good, a good cigar. A friend of mine gave this one to me. It is a uh, Bolivar and, uh, it's really good. I hope yours was good too. So, it was. Uh, thank you. <laughs> so before we sign off, I want to say this. If you are watching on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. Hit the bell icon so that you can get notified when new content is put up on my YouTube channel. And you can see all of these podcasts with the root of all success on my YouTube channel, which is at youtube.com slash C slash the real Jason Duncan. Or of course, if you're listening on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, I, you know, wherever, wherever you listen, Stitcher, uh, please subscribe. And also, if you don't mind, if you like this and it's a good, good interview and you like these podcasts, please hit a, uh, a review button and leave us a really great review. I would really appreciate that. And so next time we'll have another guest on here talking specifically about how he or she got to the success that they've experienced and how you can do the same thing. So until next time, I'm the real Jason Duncan and Jesus is King. Thank you for listening to another edition of the Root of All Success with the real Jason Duncan. If you've enjoyed this week's episode, we invite you to visit therootofallsuccess.com to access the show notes and other helpful resources. Take charge of your business. Grow it from great to incredible. Join us again next time here on The Root of All Success.